morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, hello, my name is Jelena and together with my colleague from, from Youth Action Team, uh, Natasha, I host this uh, webinar. Also, I would like to say this is not a revision song context, but 12 points goes to our, business, uh, our Youth Action Team, Madre Lisa. Uh, our graphic designers and other parts of team that are here behind us that will help. Also, goes to all of you that will us. Hope so that you are safe and sound in this pandemic situation, and also your families. And before we start, I would just uh, like to remind you that you can uh, change also language uh, interpretation language. You will find down bottom interpretation and you can change it in French and Spanish. Thanks Natasha. for the introduction, Yelena. I am Natasha. Welcome everybody. The next 90 minutes you will hear different stories from several youth activists who will help us explore how youth-led movements and groups can balance power dynamics and create healthy, equitable relationships with donors and other allies to foster social relationships. The entire webinar is being graphically recorded by our very favorite artists, Nenad, Irina, and Giovanna. Um, I would like them to turn on their videos to say hello to everybody. So... After the webinar, we're going to have a creative output. So watch out for it. We're really excited uh, about that. And Nana and Giovanna. Yeah, we, we want to see you and say hello to you. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello, team. <laughs> <laughs> we're ready to go. Great. Amazing start. <laughs> And before we continue, uh, like always, there is some rules. And uh, in this team, I'm always back up somehow, and I need to take this part. Uh, so maybe, you, as you can see, uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So, uh, and some of rules are, if you want to speak, please raise your hand, not this one. You have a uh, down bottom with your virtual hand. Also, if you want to speak, when you become in one moment one of the speaker, please turn on your, I mean, your uh, microphone and when you are finished, please turn off. Also about camera, uh, we will, you will have chance to become one of the speakers and when you come into the circle, please turn on your camera and when you are done, when, you, when we will move you, you will not have uh, option to turn on again camera. And also for those who want to uh, join us and for those who are scared to turning on camera and uh, being uh, recorded, uh, you will have option Q&A box. You, that is a box where you can ask questions, uh, speakers, us, uh, you can ask questions, other attendees. So please use that box. Natasha will look at that box. I will look at your hands. So we'll, we'll watch on you all time. So Q&A box you will find down. Please be active and help us to have amazing uh, webinar. Great. So I hope this is clear to everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, we also have two chat monitors from the Civicus team, Bistra and Yesenia who will be able to help you out. Bistra and Yesenia, if you could say hello on the chat to everybody. Uh, please feel free to ask them any questions directly. Yeah, I hope you're clear. And don't worry, we will also repeat the rules in between uh, as we progress through during the webinar. Um, before we get started with our discussions with our speakers, um, we, let us just share a little bit about ICSW 2020-21, uh, the youth action team and the dynamics of this conversation. ICSW, um, the International Civil Society Week, is a global gathering celebrated since 2014 for civil society to connect, to debate, and to share, uh, and to create shared solutions. With this virtual event, we're kicking off ICSW 2020-21, which will be a global year-long conversation on people power. And uh, the Civic is Youth Action Team, which Yelena and I both belong to, um, we are a group of young activists from different parts of the world dedicated to mainstream youth and youth issues in civicist programs and activities. 
We're here to champion youth engagement in civic spaces. This webinar is also being led and hosted by this uh, youth action team. The entire, during the entire conversation, of course, we'll be using our social media uh, to, uh, handles and using different hashtags. So you can follow the conversation as well on social media. Uh, the hashtags being used will be hashtag uh, ICSW2021, Civicus Youth, Shift the Power, Bistra and Yesenia. It would be great if you can even um, uh, you know, write down the handles as well as these hashtags so our audience can um, share about it on social media. Great. Uh, yes, Bistra and Yesenia, please share what you have to share. And a little bit about the webinar context before we continue. Uh, this webinar is organized uh, uh, because we wanted to spark a collective organization about the pressing need to rethink the types of resources provided to young activists, uh, as well as the relationship, power dynamic, emotions, challenges, and even opportunities that come with finding resources for youth work. This type of, of exploration is the core of a really exciting publication that we are launching today, and that is Playbook. Uh, in one moment, uh, uh, Bistra and Yusenia will share with you Playbook, and please look at Playbook, uh, share your feedbacks with us about Playbook, and share your stories. In this Playbook, you will find seven stories of our young activists some of which are today with us, and practical exercises to boost understanding, empathy, trust, credibility, accountability between youth and donors. Yeah, uh, the, definitely, definitely check out the playbook. I'm sure a lot of you have already received it in your emails. Um, some of our speakers also are from the playbook, so let's actually get started with them. Um, I know this is the most exciting part and everybody is eager to see who these speakers are. I want to begin first by inviting Amanda. Uh, Amanda, uh, could you turn on your video as uh, we begin the introductions? Yeah, I so, need you, you, yeah, I need you to turn on the video, please. Okay, let's have you here. Start. Is it? Hello. I think you should be. Yes, fantastic. Hi, Amanda. So, uh, Amanda is the co founder and co leader of Engaja Mundu. It is a youth led movement in Brazil. Amanda's story is featured on the playbook uh, where she shares three moments of powerful and difficult learning experiences, especially when she was transitioning out of her leadership position in Engaja Mundu. Um, also, I must say, uh, and uplift, like I've met uh, Amanda, she is a powerhouse. Uh, she has so much energy, she's a fantastic facilitator and coach. And um, her organization has done fantastic. Uh, the last year, one of their volunteers opened the Climate Summit with Greta Thunberg. So congratulations on that. And we're very eager to hear more uh, from you, Amanda, and welcome uh, for joining us. Our second speaker uh, with us is Priscilla. Priscilla, I'm going to turn your um, okay. video on as well. Okay. Yes, we should be able to see you any minute. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Priscilla. Yeah. So, uh, Priscilla is the director of Youth Harvest Foundation Ghana, a youth organization in the Upper East region of Ghana that supports young people's personal and professional empowerment. Uh, in the playbook, Priscilla shares the difficulties in dealing with donor restrictions and how their organization um, has tried to generate small income through their sustainability strategy. Again, I have had the privilege of uh, meeting Priscilla and uh, she was a goalkeeper and uh, she won the award for being a goalkeeper for their work. And I must say like her story is so inspiring where she joined the organization as a volunteer and rose to the leadership, now leading it as the director. Welcome Priscilla, it's uh, Thank you. lovely to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, uh, good morning, uh, Amanda, and hello, Priscilla. And now, good evening, Justin. And I will now turn on your uh, camera. Wait. Uh, okay. And the last one, but not least one, 
uh, our colleague from New Texture team, Justin. He is amazing uh, executive director of Youth Voices Count, a regional network of young LGBTIQ people, persons in the Asia Pacific region, working on several sexual, reproductive, health, and human rights issues. One uh, fun fact. Uh, this time we needed to be in Quito, in Ecuador, but because of the um, uh, pandemic situation, we are here on the webinar. And the last year in this time, uh, I met Justin on, on the Youth Assembly that was part of the International Civil Society Week. Uh, Justin is working amazing uh, job with uh, LGBTIQ persons. Uh, he's also one of the organizers of Pride there, and he has amazing energy and he will share his amazing stories today with us. Hello, Justin. Hi, Elena. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Hello. And uh, before we continue, I will try now to explain you uh, how will we work, uh, what is concept of this webinar, and what will what rules we will have. We will use uh, one amazing tool that a lot of youth workers and a lot of uh, Moderators are using it. That is a uh, fishbowl. I will now share my screen that you can see it and follow when I'm speaking. One moment. Okay. Okay. Technical. So, if you didn't heard previously about uh, fishbowl technique, you are one of 7.58 billion people on this planet. That is um a lot of people, so congratulations. And you're also one of those 150 people who will today experiment this uh, fishbowl technique online. So what is a fishbowl virtual conversation? As you can see, uh, we have here uh, three speakers and two moderators, me and Natasha. But yeah, we have also, that is like uh, five chairs, but we have six chairs. One chair is always empty. And how also you, you can see that your mic and camera uh, are turned off. You cannot turn on by yourself camera and mic. Why? Because if you want to do it, you need to become one of the speakers. How you will do it? You will raise your hand, your virtual hand, not this one. And then I will follow. In one moment, I, when we finish with uh, our speakers, with questions for them, uh, I will call one of you to come inside of that circle. And when you come inside of that circle, one of our speakers will go outside of the circle. So we will always have three speakers. And our goal is that in one moment, we have all our main speakers outside the circle. Sorry, guys and three new attendees as speakers. But we will not have just three attendees as speakers, we want to have more attendees as speakers, because we want for you to share us your stories, your comments, your questions. And also you can uh, ask panelists in any moment whatever you want in your Q&A box. And also if you want to ask them live, when you come inside of a uh, circle, we can also bring again one of one uh, one of panelists inside the circle just please when you uh, panelists when you go outside the circle please mute yourself that is really important for us because we want to continue this nicely so please be active be proactive uh, help us do this uh, webinar be amazing and natasha the floor is yours Great. Okay. I think, I hope everything is uh, clear over here. There are two things. The hand for being a part of the speaker and the uh, Q&A box. Ask your question directly. Uh, and I'm sure as the discussion starts, there will be questions coming up. So keep populating that box. Um, I'll be looking out for it. So with that, uh, let's get started for this discussion. Um, and I would actually want to uh, begin the conversation with Amanda Yu. Um, you've done fabulous work over the years uh, working with climate uh, activists all over Brazil. How have you managed to balance power with donors and stakeholders that fund your work? Um, how has that relation? And, you know, when you, especially when you're sharing this bit, I just want to reiterate uh, 
the ICSW theme is people power. So I thought that would be the best way to even begin. And if you could start that with a little bit about your story and how uh, has that journey and you know experience been for you? Okay, thank you, Natasha. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for organizing this. Thank you, the YAT team and the Civicus for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today to share my story. As Natasha said, I'm one of the founders of Engajamundo. We are a youth-led NGO based here in Brazil. Uh, now we are eight years old. <laughs> uh, so it's a young organization as well. And since the beginning, we struggled a lot to mobilize resources to fund our work. Uh, we work a lot with volunteers throughout the, um, the country. So we're spread. We have more than 2,000 volunteers uh, right now. And since the beginning, this was a, a struggle that I can imagine a lot of you uh, shared. So I hope today I can share with you the in this discussion, I can contribute to strength more and more um, to the youth organizations and youth activists here uh, in, in this webinar. Uh, so what we worked with to balance the power between donors and, and the organization, uh, there's something that I would like to, to raise here is that also, the donors are people on the other side of the table. So I usually like to think of them as other human beings that are having resources to give and to make this transformation that we are talking about. So here in Brazil, we would like to change the behavior of youth to be more engaged on their communities. Uh, so also the donors, they are seeking to find those organizations and how can we meet each other? So where is the best place for us to meet each other, to showcase our work and also for them to see the, the work we are doing here. Um, and it's a mutual help. So b both of us, we, we need each other. And when we're talking about the grassroots, like who is on the, on the ground, on the field, working with youth? So are the youth organizations uh, and movements and activists that are doing a very important work. So what I think and what I, I like to, to bring to the conversation is the cooperation. So it's a mutual relationship that we have to see each other as a win-win cooperation. So it's not because not here where the resources uh, we are talking about bring more power to the donors, for example, like uh, money to donate. Uh, but it's, we need to figure this balance to through conversations and showing uh, the work we, we are doing on the field. So as back here uh, at the organization, we work a lot with behavior change um, with the youth constituency through climate change, for example, through the sustainable development. And this is not always very measurable. So one thing that is very important to us and that worked with us on this relationship it's telling people stories. So tell the stories of these youth that are uh, struggling, but also that are doing amazing work to raise their voices. And one way to do this, and it worked a lot for us, is bringing the donors to see the work that we do. It's not always easy, I know, because you have to have a, a good relationship with them already. But to promote this uh, encounter is uh, very transformative. Um, it's not always uh, easy and I don't know, I have uh, a little bit more time to share another yeah, story. Continue, 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 please. Okay, okay, perfect. So this is something that goes well with, uh, with us. That's a good case uh, that I can share with you. But that's not always been so easy. So as I shared, we are 
working uh, for eight years now. And at the beginning, we struggled a lot to find this balance also uh, between how to prioritize what is uh, important. So which uh, funds are important to seek and which fund could be a waste of our time uh, as like um, back in 2015, we were struggling a lot to fund the work. Uh, we were uh, all volunteers. We didn't have money to, to put the events on the ground and to make the meetings to happen. And we accept to do an uh, outside event as a, a consultants uh, for an event that didn't have a lot to do with our work on the ground. But we need a lot of money that this uh, event could bring to us. And after we ended, it was very crazy. Like it, we worked like double shifts because, and I imagine a lot of people here are working double shifts or three shifts to, to do their youth work and to fund their work, uh, working somewhere else as the consultants, as um, many jobs that we perform. And that this time, we were five girls working uh, to manage the organization and we had this very important discussion to um, see, this, is this worth or is this not? And back then it was worth because we need some money to uh, put our work in the world, but uh, we understood a lot that we had to focus and prioritize the work we were doing at the organization so we could um, make it grow and to achieve more young people. And I think this was a very important lesson that uh, for me um, led the other decisions and the other relationships with donors and within the organization as well. So how can we make better decisions and prioritize our time that is very valuable and the resources that we are seeking. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, both Yelena and I were aggressively nodding. I'm very sure so were most of our um, participants. Um, I wanted to actually, uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, examples uh, on things you were doing initially. Are there any key lessons that you have that you would like to share? Um, and especially, you know, uh, when you are a young organization, there are many different uh, mistakes you make, which are the greatest source of inspiration and like, you know, uh, newer pathways that develop after that. So are there any examples of mistakes you've made that you would never want to repeat or you would want to warn everybody to be aware of uh, or any such uh, uh, examples like you were sharing earlier? Yeah, I think one is uh, very important is go with your principles because sometimes it seems that it's easier for us to just accept an offer uh, that changes a little bit uh, the purpose of your work. Uh, but what I think it's very important of youth organizations is that we stand uh, for what, what we stand for is very unique and our voices uh, come from, um, it could be even seen as naive because we, we believe that we can change the world uh, very dr dramatically. So this is, this is very um, like a very tenue line that, what is our, my principles and what could be a good offer for a donor? And I think it's a lesson that goes with your inner self and, and your organization values that could, could be very, take a lot of reflection. Yeah. No, thank you so much for that. I think that's such an important uh, aspect, like understanding what are your non-negotiables. Uh, and working through that relationship along the way, because it's also important to constantly communicate uh, those values externally um, as you work. I, um, it, it's interesting, something that you mentioned uh, initially, and I want to move on to Priscilla uh, on that bit. 
uh, which was around uh, sustainability and figuring out how do you know when relationships are good or bad so priscilla um, i i yeah could you actually unmute yourself i want to to ask you the next question so yeah okay awesome now you're on mute Yeah so yeah. your organization has been working for 17 years and there is so much knowledge you have uh, to share with us especially when you build those relationships with donors how uh, have you learned uh, what forms a good uh, relationship and what forms a bad relationship how does one know okay thank you so much natasha and uh, the whole team and um, it's a pleasure to be with you and um, i think it's an opportunity for me to 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 have this platform to share our experiences like you said in the beginning youth avest foundation gana uh, was established in 2002 uh, it's actually a youth focused organization basically our mission is to empower and support young people to achieve their full potentials in their personal lives professional development for them to become active advocates for the rights of young people and in and that they are able to contribute to sustainable environment So over the years we we have been working with young people at the grassroots level um advocating for the rights of young people uh, using youth ambassadors to lead their campaign and so the youth ambassadors are the ones who are in direct contact with the communities engaging with their peers engaging with community leaders engaging with um key duty bearers holding them accountable and asking for things that are affecting young people and so they are able to change some social cultural norms that promote child marriage teenage pregnancy and 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 that hinders the education of young people and so i i just want to give a little background uh, because of this our our activities are organized in four main thematic areas in the area of education adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights we work in the area of uh, employable and entrepreneurial skills development and we have a little bit of agri business and market system development all these areas are strongly interconnected in the sense that uh, for a young person to be able to develop you certainly need education and so with the level of education that you are able to acquire be it primary or secondary level it puts you at that level than somebody who has never had access to education and so how what happens to those who are not able to progress to the next level and that is where we bring the little bit of the entrepreneurial skills development where we we train them to be able to make some little income and and things like that and uh, not to bore you so much about the work that we do but i i can say that we also engage in a national level advocacy campaigns where we are advocating for for young people uh for the government to adopt and implement adolescent sexual and reproductive health education into the educational curriculum by this uh, a lot of young people will be empowered with knowledge with information so they can make informed choices of their lives and in that way they they are able to to stay longer in school and come up with successful learning outcomes now back to your question um well we have been in existence for almost 17 years now and i i cannot just say that the journey has been smooth for us uh, like amanda started at the beginning it was not easy the founding members of this organization had to take money from their own pockets contributed to get this organization registered we started voluntary work before we had our first donor and but uh, over the years we have worked with a number of donors and i want to focus more on the the good donors because uh, we seems to be lucky with them and for you to 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 know who is a bad and a good donor over the years what we have realized is that a number of donors that we have worked with really have interest in the growth and development of our organization and when i say growth and development these are donors that come to you and they are not only looking at the outcome or the result that you produce at the end of the day but they want to leave something behind in that when they are living they are able to transfer knowledge they are able to build your capacity so that you can become independent uh, once they exit we have come we have had encounter with some of these donors before Uh, and i can say the most recent one is is cervicals uh with the goalkeeper project is so wonderful they have given us that much support in terms of capacity building in terms of exposure as a grassroots organization we wouldn't have had all these opportunities if not for good donors like them um for you to know who is a good donor we 
also have to look at donors who focus on the sustainability of the project. We have had an encounter with a number of donors that have uh, piloted projects with us, for instance, for six months, after which we evaluated the project. And then we saw that there was something good about this project. We sat together on the same table to develop proposals. And then we went in to apply for bigger grants. And we have since upgraded this project from initial pilot phase to the next phase. And now we are at the third phase of the project. And so these are the types of donors that I called good donors. Uh, we have also had the opportunity of working with donors who give room, more room for, for, for implementing partners to make mistakes and learn. They are not the type that say, okay, you said you, you were going to work with this work plan. We are following these strict rules. And so you must deliver on this. They, they give us that um, opportunity to review as and when it is necessary to look at the work plans and adjust so that at the end of the day, we all achieve the same objectives. So these are the people I consider as, as good donors and, and many more that if I want to continue, we might not end. But I, we equally have come into contact with bad donors. I wouldn't say as bad in quotes, but not it's a, totally bad, but donors who come with strict, strict, strict rules. It's sometimes frustrating. Uh, you, you have a donor who gives you support, okay, to acquire capital equipment, and then the donor tells you, okay, you, you don't have to use this equipment for other projects. What happens, for instance, if it is a vehicle, and and I that happens to be the only vehicle for the organization, and you say because your 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 project or your money bought the vehicle, the vehicle should not be used for other projects. And that if this is used for other projects, it's likely to break down before the end of your project. And sometimes it's frustrating. Even though the donor is not sitting there with you to monitor, but in an event that you, you discharge this vehicle to implement other projects on the field and something uh, significant happens to this vehicle, uh, maybe fire or a, a significant breakdown, how are you going to account to this donor who has already given you instruction not to use his vehicle for other projects? And so these are some of the difficulties that I have shared in the playbook uh, that that was launched this morning, or I don't know if this is yet to be launched. And I urge everybody to read that playbook. It's very, very important for, for youth organization to learn some of these experiences that can be able to guide our work. And, and when we learn these experiences, we are able to, to know how to negotiate um, uh, our way with donors. We've had experience with donors who, who want to impose their own organizational policies on us. Come on. I, I have my internal policies. Why do you come to uh, in, uh, tell me to use your timesheets? You, you want me to use um, your leave tracker. For instance, you are changing my, my whole organizational administrative manual and, and all the things that are inside this manual that um, sort of motivate um, my staff. For instance, if you are going on official duty or, or night allowances and things, and then you bring your own administrative manual, you bring your own leave tracker, you bring your own timesheet, and you want to impose it on, on me because you are giving me funding. And so, like Amanda said, sometimes we have to stand on our feet as youth organization and be principled and say no to such donors to say that I have my internal policies. Can we sit down on the table to discuss this policies together vis-a-vis -vis your policies and see how these policies, policies can meet so that at the end of the day, my organization can also be strengthened when you are living so that you don't come to break down my whole system and then after a year or two, I have to start all over again. It is not yeah. easy. And so um, there is a lot to share about bad donors and there's a lot to share about good donors. I, I don't know if I still have time. I can continue to talk and talk, but... Uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we definitely want to hear more. It looks like our participants have already started asking so many questions. Uh, sure. Pimila, you've triggered the sure. conversation. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad that is going on. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have. We also have some bad donors who want to micromanage your projects. As youth organizations, we have to to make sure this do not happen. How do you dictate? as to how the project should be managed. 
I, I understand we, we, we enter into an agreement, we sign contracts, we have work plans that guide the work that we do. But after that, youth organizations should be given that room to mm -hmm. exercise their own discretion in the implementation of the project such that you, you lace up with the donor as and when it is necessary to review some of these work plans that you initially yeah. started with them so that if it's necessary to adjust your work plan in the midway of the implementation of the project for the sake of getting desired outcomes, that should be accepted. But we have some donors who would not allow this and say, yeah. no, you cannot change. You cannot change what we agreed. It is in the contract and we must go strictly to the contract. And we equally have some bad donors who do not care about what kind of results you send to them, whether it is authentic or, or they want results that has really created impact at the, at the grassroots level. And so we have all these types of donors, excuse me to say, uh, even though they are giving us money to implement projects, sometimes we as youth or young people have to think out of the box and then we have to let the donors know that we are, we are, we are capable of taking charge of the projects that we deliver right. so that they can have that confidence, they can have that trust in us and, and allow us to implement the project the way we think that at the end of the day, we will get the desired results and give them the good feedback that they always, they always want, uh, want from, wanted from us. Sorry and, and interrupting so, you. Uh, yeah. We have several amazing questions for you in the Q&A box. Also, okay. guys, uh, please keep asking questions. Uh, ask questions to our, uh, our speakers and be ready to raise your hands uh, to become one of the speakers. And Natasha, would you like to ask some of the questions now or we can do it later? Yeah, I was, I was thinking, uh, I think definitely, I think if this conversation starts, there's going to be no stopping. How about we proceed uh, with uh, Justin and address all these questions together? So okay. please populate the question box and we'll uh, address them together. Okay. okay. Then we will continue. Uh, Justin, are you ready? <laughs> I think I am. Yeah. Great, amazing. Uh, I will ask you some few simple questions, some simple NGO questions about donors. And one of them are, uh, what are some sustainable funding models that you have tested? Can you explain us the, some of the models that you find that are interesting, that are uh, okay, that, uh, that you can use uh, with uh, different kind of uh, different kind of funding models and different kind of donors? Mm -hmm. yeah, very very yeah. simple question, Justin, for you. The most simple. Well, one. thanks. <laughs> thanks, Elena, and and thanks, Natasha. So, hi everyone. I'm Justin. I'm the executive director of Youth Voice Discount. So it's Do I have just problem to see to hear, to hear Justin? Me too. Justin, can you try to reconnect? Uh, we cannot hear you, Justin. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, be when we are waiting, uh, Justin, to reconnect. This is, of course, webinar. Uh, maybe uh, Natasha, you can uh, ask other questions uh, to Priscilla and Amanda, and we will wait, uh, Justin, to reconnect. I will contact him. Yes. Yes. Um, so there are, I, okay. The, it looks like the audience already knows what's going to happen next because there are questions, uh, about social in initiatives and enterprises as well. Um, and uh, Amanda and Priscilla were uh, given till the time Justin's coming back, please feel free to respond to these, um, so one of the questions is that when is the right time to introduce a business model into your social campaign or program? Um, how to know when can a social initiative be turned into a social enterprise? Um, it's a question around sustainability, um, especially when initially uh, you don't, you're not receiving funds. So how do you uh, make it an enterprise? 
does either of you want to go ahead anti pathi anti i can uh say that we here we are an ngo so we haven't uh, become a social enterprise we try to so we did some business model like canva we did some studies uh, to see if it would be possible for us as an alternative uh, but um going with the purpose of the organization our vision and uh what we would like to achieve it didn't uh suit for us but it it doesn't mean that it's not going to it's going to be like that forever so what we do like it's like every 3 years we do a um, a vision for the for the 3 years ahead and set those um those steps and see if what we need to achieve but um yeah i'm sorry i cannot uh contribute uh, exactly to this one yeah priscilla do you uh, want to take that because uh, your organization took up some initiatives to make your work sustainable um so do you want to share examples of that uh, some initiatives you started sure Thank you Natasha. Um I would want to say that um the exact time to introduce the business model into your work um that really depends on on you. Um for us uh, at the beginning the focus was the campaign making the change uh effecting the change at the society level. and so that the beginning the energy was was at this level but it got to a point that we realized that the funding was not sustainable and so you cannot always rely on the donors to to send you money so you can go to the communities to engage and so we started thinking uh, within ourselves how can we mobilize resources locally um to to ensure that we are able to sustain the basic needs that we need at the office level for instance uh, running a photocopier a machine having a printer and having a couple of laptops and then we we, we buy some bundle with internet where young people can walk in to to browse the internet because at this part of the country is still not easily available for all young people to have access to to the internet and so this thought came into mind and so we we started a computer cafe um apart from that uh, we wanted to promote a uh, natural fruit juice because we we saw that there's a lot of carbonated drinks that are being served to young people and and it is not that healthy so how can we pro- pro- promote the natural uh, uh consumption of fruits and so we also started a smoothie cafe and and this cafe basically you can walk in at any time and request for any smoothie of your type be it mango flavor pineapple flavor and it is prepared right there for you and 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 so we 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 took into consideration some of the the health benefits and the economic aspect and and so at which point you should introduce a business model would depend on which level you are in the implementation of 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 your vision so that you know that uh, at some point in time you will run out of funds and so yeah. how can i begin to think out of the box so that at the yeah. point that i do not have funds i will be able to rely on these resources to sustain myself for some time so I, i think that's yeah. really helpful uh, yeah. very direct and you know also depends on how everybody's model is also working thank you for those two examples as well i think uh, justin is uh, back uh, yelena please uh, yeah justin uh, hello again uh, do you want if you want i can repeat your question or yeah no, i will repeat your question because of uh, our attendees it's okay So uh can you tell us what are some sustainable finding models that you have tested in your uh work experience in your organization? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much Ina and Natasha and apologies for the for the quick technical issue there. Don't um, worry, so again, be happy. Sorry? Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> thank you so much. Um so 
Uh, so I work for Youth Voices Count. Like I said, it's a regional network for young LGBTIQ people and work mainly on sexual and reproductive uh, health and rights and also for gender equality in, in Asia Pacific region. Um, so I'll go straight to answering the question. Um, I wanted to say earlier that I think the issue is not necessarily, you know, having bad donors. What I think is the issue is the current sort of grant, grant making um, and grant provi providing schemes are what is the problem because from the moment you apply for the grant, the selection process, um, to the implementation and the monitoring and evaluation, that whole process right there, at any point in time, um, once you're not honest enough, once you don't um, communicate your values, and once you don't challenge and build a, a, a good relationship with your donor at any point in that process, um, it's going to go wrong, you know? Um, and that's when we sort of start to think that, oh, maybe the donors are not responding to our needs. Um, but maybe it could be because we do not communicate our needs or we don't communicate our lived realities to our donors. Um, and this is something that I learned from reading the playbook. Um, for the participants, my, my story and my organization is not um, featured in the playbook. But what I can share with you is... Um, with Youth Voices Count, we provide small grants to LGBTIQ organizations in Asia. And one thing I learned from, from that process that we've done over the years of providing small grants and supporting the growth of youth-led LGBTIQ networks is not all realities are, are the same. And this is where we recognize diversity. And this is how we practice inclusion. Um, we might be doing diversity and inclusion in the work that we do, but does our donors, um, our funders, realize our lived realities, our contexts? Um, and a lot of organizations that work on LGBTIQ, for example, because um, that's sort of <clears throat> my focus, um, work in restrictive environments where just being LGBTIQ um, puts you in, uh, you know, criminalizes you, you know? And that's the same for women. That's the same for a lot of other marginalized groups, indigenous people, for example, persons with disabilities. So that's where recognizing diversity and inclusion comes in, even for the donor. And once they recognize that restrictive environment is not allowing you to operate properly, if the donor recognizes that reality, then they are being responsive to your needs. Then they're being a, do a good donor. Then they're being... Um, building a good relationship with you because what matters is your lived realities your operations your programming <clears throat> and the other thing i wanted to share is um and this is sort of a side note in order for a donor to be good and to be a donor that respects your needs as organizations that are are led by young people they should acknowledge the self-care and the well-being of the grantees or of the donee or the donees or the beneficiaries or whatever term um, um, you're, you're using because self-care is first and foremost the, the most important thing you know we take care of ourselves we take care of organ or of our organizations so a lot of the donors that I've dealt with I've always demanded that a key component of our of our sort of administrative costs or even programmatic costs should go into the self-care of our partners, of our staff, of our network in general. Um, and if they also recognize that self-care is important and well-being is important, then that's just being a good donor. Um, yeah, so, I mean, to answer the sustainability aspect, uh, I mean, communicate well. Communicate well with your donor and... Um, make sure that they know what exactly you need and don't and never shy away from saying no i mean it shouldn't always be yes 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 at a certain point you need to say no thank you yeah thank you uh, i have one question from uh, your perspective for example uh in my region in balkan are uh, different uh, when you have donor that is from the europe that is not from the from the balkan uh, is the same uh, in your situation. Do you have a different communication with international donors than uh, with donors from your region? Yeah. Um, no, that was a great question because um, I'm actually reading a book. It's called uh, The Second Sex. 
um, by Simone de Beauvoir, which is a, a, fem- a French feminist. And a part of the book, if I can quickly read it, um, actually talks about, you know, how some realities and human problems um, cannot be dealt without partiality, you know? And that and that's how I that's sometimes how I deal with with donors who are who don't come from the same region as me. You know, I come from Asia and a lot of our donors come from from North America or or Europe. Um and the whole notion of the global south, there's there's a there's a, a an imbalance or even a, a disparity in how we even call or countries at the global south um necessarily needing of the needs or uh, needing of the support of donors from the from the no- global north or whatever um so just going back again to how we how we kind of deal with our <clears throat> with our donors and how we create good communication and and um and relationships with our donors yeah Okay, amazing. And uh, I would like to ask Priscilla because uh, she mentioned, uh, you've mentioned in your uh, playbook story that uh, it's really difficult when you need uh, to have a lot of donors per year, for example. And because a lot of organizations do not have uh, fundings, great, uh, great fundings from one or two donors, that they don't need to find other donors. Uh, what are you doing in that moment? Do you start your entrepreneurships or what you do? Please, can you take that again? You mean currently what we do? Yeah, uh, because I I uh, read in your story that uh, you have problem because there is no donors that wants to be one stable donor each year. So you need always to find exactly. new one. Exactly. And uh, I read it also in your story that you start in some entrepreneurship uh, in your organization with uh, juices or something. And is that backup plan for organizations? Sure. So, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, one of the one of the support we've had over the years from donors is, is, is setting up a, a girls a girls remedial school. Where, where we target vulnerable girls from deprived communities who have failed their papers and give them a second chance to rewrite these papers so they can progress to the next level, at the tertiary level. And, and this particular donor had, had been giving us funding every year. And basically what we do is we bring these girls to the media school. We have a local accommodation for them. Uh, we keep them in the local accommodation for, for six months. And while they are in, in, in our youth center, they have access to electricity to, to read in the night. They have access to the library. They have access to uh, tuition from volunteer teachers. And, and this is something we have been running for, for the past three years. Um, but unfortunately, uh, last year, the donor communicated to us. They're actually not donors per se, but these are also a group of people who really buy into our passion uh, of empowering young people. And they come together to also raise funding from their colleagues and from their community, and they send this money to us to run this school. So we, we actually had a communication from them. Uh, telling us that we should give them uh, one more year to, to raise funding to come back to supporting us to run this school. And so because of that, we, we, have, we were not able to run the school um, last year. And then this year as well, we are hoping that um, we were able to secure some little funding that we are hoping that this year we, we should be able to run the school. And so we, we are now, this, this, this breakup uh, or this uh, sudden break in the, supply, in, the, in the sending of the money from the, from the donors gave us that insight that we have to begin to look at within ourselves, our local level. These are people from our own communities. What can the community also do to support their own people? Because we don't also have to always wait for people somewhere to send us money to take care of your children. And so we, we, we have started to do some little fundraising, mobilizing funds from the local people and from, from benevolent individuals who are willing to support this idea. And so that is what we are currently doing and hoping that we should be able to raise the amount to continue the Girls Remedial School. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Natasha? Yes. Thank you, uh, Priscilla. I am already seeing so many questions popping up and four hands raised. 
um thank you all the speakers i think we're we're at a time where now we should move towards our fish bowl uh, just a reminder this is the slide that yelena showed everybody um at the start yelena do you want to quickly uh, tell everybody uh, take take us through and get started mm -hmm. with that first part i can do it wait mm -hmm. So just letting everybody know whoever wants to be part of this fish bowl raise your um hands and people will be invited into it uh one by one uh, we want we uh, we want to hear from everybody um and so make sure that your comments or your story or your question is limited within 2 to 3 minutes maximum um once somebody has had a chance to speak you will be removed and uh, be turned into an attendee and someone else will be uh, added as a panelist um yelena has two uh, signs as well to go slower or faster uh, or louder to help you uh, keep going in the conversation yeah yeah, uh, yeah. if yeah, there is any question you. please ask in the chat yes thank you that's why as always i will be bad girl bad boy so if you are speaking uh, you are you are not speaking loud I will raise this one if you're speaking really fast that our translators can translate what you're speaking then you will see this one. Okay, uh Natasha do you want to like because before I ask uh, our first uh, new speaker to come inside do you want, we want to like mention do we want like to mention covid question. Yes, I think uh, a couple of uh, it has also come up in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question on how do we negotiate with conversations on um, COVID. So um, there uh, is going to be space. I'm just thinking. Um, I, I would definitely want our speakers to be mindful and start like helping us figure out this question because we definitely want to address it uh, uh, as we move in the conversation. Um, cool so let's uh, begin i see uh, uh, dumi's yeah. hand up uh, dumi we would like to invite you in to the panel uh, yelena is going to quickly yes answer. i did it awesome dumi can think, you i think he's just transitioning in yeah he is here dumi please uh, turn on your mic and camera yes yes uh one of the speakers will be now moved to an attendee so uh, yeah. if that happens don't worry yeah let us see mm, that i will move firstly priscilla away hi everybody. hello to me hi We're not able to hear you, Dumi. Yeah, we are not able. Dumi, can you? Hi, say everyone. Um, yeah, as was said, my name is Dumi, and one of my stories was actually shared on there. And I really thank Amanda. You can't hear me. I'm mute. I'm saying can hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And please speak slower. I know oh, that you have so amazing energy. Okay. I know that you have amazing energy and that you like to speak and you're a great motivational speaker but please because of our <laughs> translators slower do we do you want to kick us off with uh, any of your experiences and stories especially on youth resourcing uh, and uh, the work that you've been doing thank you so much i hope i am clear now can you hear me like, totally clear <laughs> Great, fantastic. So, um I'm just going to share some other resources or questions that I answered on um some fundraising platforms uh in order to just sort of save time. But um one of my stories was actually shared in the playbook and I think um I'm really grateful for Amanda, Priscilla and Justin for doing like the groundwork because they said quite a lot. But um the first thing that came to mind for me is um mental health. And you know in the journey that we take as activists and organizers, you know mental health isn't always perceived as a strong point or it isn't always included as one of the um, uh, project priorities. And I think in understanding the fact that you know as an organizer 
you don't necessarily always have the skills in terms of finance, in terms of monitoring and evaluation, and even just in terms of care. Because when, you're, when, when your only eligibility is project activities, that means that they're limited to impact. So I think these are some of the things that we need to acknowledge over and above the more larger um, economic issues, you know, whether it's income country status and also working on uh, taboo issues such as LGBTIQ um, youth issues. So I think, you know, the mental health aspects, particularly for individuals who have survived atrocities and who are still working to ensure that there's some level of dignity within the community that they're supporting. And I think just to sort of integrate the COVID-19 question, um, since it seems like it has come up quite a bit, you know, for us, particularly with the fact that we have limited resources, um, and I think the fact that a lot of enablers and donors have acknowledged that um, the LGBTIQ communities are already vulnerable, already at risk, and having learned from the HIV pandemic, um, they started um, sort of uh, creating emergency mechanisms. But what is the challenge with emergency mechanisms? You find that a grant process will take about three weeks. So when you're talking about an emergency or a rapid response mechanism that takes anything more than two weeks, you are finding yourself in a situation that probably ends up getting more aggravated or when you're not able to prevent harm and um, pain being perpetuated within the community. So I think that's one important aspect is in considering the mental health um, issues of surviving and also um, un undocumented care work in terms of supporting community members beyond just project. Uh, we can... To hear you again, Rumi. Um, a second aspect. Um, I think something changed. You're something okay now. Oh, thank you. Sorry, it's. I it must be my. Uh, we can hear you again. Um, yeah, and so um, I think it's very money follows people. Can you hear me now? Yes? No? Okay. Um, so I think we must also acknowledge that sometimes money follows people. So it's very critical to understand that, um, you know, to, you must acknowledge that um, you know feedback in some instances where young people are involved, they don't carry as much weight because they're not as established or they haven't occupied enough spaces. What has been helpful for other groups is that when they started out, they were part of a larger collective. So they were either in a part of an incubation program, if it's like a social enterprise, or if it's an NGO, it was part of a larger network, which then got access in terms of larger HIV funding. And I mean, if you're playing in the space of HIV, specific to LGBTI communities, then you'd know that the Global Fund on HIV, TB, and Malaria, and um, PEPFAR or USAID are the biggest funders. And so you find these are very technical. There are certain um, limited eligibility issues, a lot of bureaucratic red tape. So having an organization that would obviously have the capacity and be able to meet those hoops that need to be jumped is very critical in um, being successful at inception stage. Um, the last third point that I think is very important um, are the untold secrets. So for instance, um, we had one case where, you know, we had presented a proposal and um, I guess because it was the beginning of the financial year it wasn't taken up. Two years later when the three-year cycle project was ending we reached out and told them that there are certain opportunities that we have play, and this is how you can be able to support us and they did just that. You are ending up in a crisis like COVID-19. We must acknowledge and understand that you need a certain level of flexibility. And I think there isn't any more flexibility than that to be able to pay salaries or that to be able to pay for social protections. And I think these are some of the critical things where a lot of youth groups are having a challenge um, to be able to get, to get support from. But there are a lot of new mechanisms that are in play where some donors will end up suggesting that they get infrastructure support, that they get core support, but it's not necessarily always the best in terms of operating model. And I think lastly, just to mention is, I think it's very important for us to understand Sorry, Dumi, uh, we can hear you again. And when we're looking at, and that world, 
Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it, try to keep it short and simple because, yeah. because we have a lot of raised hands and we oh, have 20 very, minutes more, okay. 25 minutes more. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's just ensuring that, you know, acknowledging that sustainability isn't always something. Sustainability means you have the means to stay in the same um, condition and to be able to do the same level of work. And that requires resources, able to sustain themselves, have the benefit of endowments or bounty year funding. So a lot of young, young organizations are yet to get to that point where they're able to tap into the kinds of um, grants and uh, funding that those kinds of privileges. I'll share more on, on the chat. Thank you, uh, Dumi, for sharing uh, uh, with us your story. And I would like now to invite one more speaker from this. Uh, let's see, first of all, uh, Tarinda. Mm, one second. Tarinda, hello, Tarinda. And uh, Amanda, you are going out. Hello. Hello, Tarinda. Hi. Can Hello, you Tarina. hear me well and can you guys see me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so just a few points. First of all, let me just thank uh, ICWS, Natasha and Oliver, all the guys who made the point. So that was very interesting. So just to sort of keep it very short. So my name is Tarinda and I come from an island off the south coast of India called Sri Lanka. And it's interesting to follow Justin and Dumi because my foray into activism was also working with LGBT organizations here in Sri Lanka. And then I moved from that to civil engagements and youth activism and all of that. And now I happen to my, find myself in the space of a donor. So, I, I, uh, so I'll, I'll make a few points from the perspective of a youth activist working with a young organization, which is, which is a volunteer organization just like Amanda's. So in terms of, so if you are to address the whole COVID situation, there are, because in terms of realities, what we have to understand is social movements are inherently social. And for them to be inherently social, we also need to have the space for us to get together, for us to protest, for us to come together, to share ideas, or to even have a counter protest against something the government is doing. And given the current COVID situation where we see certain government and states tightening their controls, tightening civic spaces, and also placing this within the broader context, rather, where there is reduced funding, so essentially the pie is shrinking. And a lot of the young organizations like us is fighting for a pie that has already started shrinking ages ago. And with COVID, some of these funds are now being redirected to COVID efforts. So we're going to see a future where there's not going to be enough funds left to come back for development needs, LGBT issues, women's rights, and all of that. So I think as you, young organizations, as youth organizations, we need to ensure that we maintain that space and fight to maintain that space that we already want, especially given in context of countries where you have restrictive governments, where there's legislation, to stop you criticizing government officials, which was enacted recently in Sri Lanka, uh, in terms of criticizing public health officials, in terms of COVID. So this is, these are ways that the governments will always try to sort of block and stop the work that you do. Uh, another thing, so some of the tips that I can share, how we started off as a volunteer organization, hashtag generation, which was, I was not the co-founder, it was a couple of friends who founded the organization. And then we ran on volunteers. What that also meant was that because we were running on volunteers, we had to ensure that for the donors, that the volunteers brought in enough capacity to deliver on the needs that we wanted to see results, but also at the same level and the pace and the quality that the donors needed. And collating all of this together, when you have a volunteer group where people come from different backgrounds, different education levels, it's also a very strategic calculation that we had to make as a volunteer organization that we would headhunt for certain types of individuals so that it increases our wider portfolio. So hashtag generation now has moved on from functioning from just volunteers to securing donors that 
have been funding them. And I think I remember one of the speakers saying, there is some truth to that the money will always follow the good work. I think that was just it. And I think I need to agree with that to a certain extent, because with the model with hashtag, what we've seen is because of the quality of the work that we've been putting out, money has always followed us in the sense donors have always been the first to approach us. But this is also understanding the ground reality that some of us are well connected than the others. And in doing so, we've always looked to leverage these connections as well as the networks that we need. Because at the end of the day, one of the most things that are also important in fundraising, especially for young organizations, is the social networking that we bring onto the table. And we need to always ensure that, yes, we have disagreements. It's, it's always a golden rule of praise in public, criticize in private. So, because if Tarana, you're on a wrong footing with it, sorry. Tarana, yes. If I may interrupt, because I think you're going in the direction where exactly a lot of our questions have also come from our participants. So maybe I can raise those questions and if you can respond accordingly. Yes, uh, yes. Also, also, because you have the donor perspective. So I'm, I'm sure everyone's eager to hear. A couple of things that have come up is, uh, is under the broad umbrella of the language of communication with donors. Um, there are many, like that line is quite blurred. So how do one negotiate uh, with donors? What are some tips and tricks like and practices to follow? So like you were saying uh, on networking as well. So what are the other things uh, one can do? Um, similarly, like how can one use language uh, in a way that that balances power dynamics uh, with donors and increases accessibility uh, of the donors? Okay. So in terms of, um, okay, I'll sort of break this down in terms of, I think in terms of tips for young organizations, specifically from a donor perspective, for most of the young organizations, most of the donors from where I stand now, we don't necessarily look, expenditure is a problem. And in a, in a certain sense, we do look for expenditure levels. We have an idea, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, we need to have 75% of expenditure levels before we release a second tranche. This is something that all of us are familiar with. But donors are willing to make leeways if you're a young organization, which has shown that you can deliver on the quality of work. So this is where the strategic network building and also strategic buildup of the organizational mandate, as well as the key resource people within the organization is very important. Because writing a good report, writing a draft proposal goes a long way. From a donor perspective, if we are to receive a proposal, which it doesn't have to be flashy, it doesn't have to have gimmicks, it doesn't have to be a perfect PDF or whatnot, as long as you communicate well, whether because donors, because larger international donors will request proposals in multiple languages depending on the locality. So this, this can also be sent in your local language. But it, there's, a, there's a truth to the fact that in details do matter. So if you're sending a proposal, these are just minor things that donors will start to question your work if the proposal itself has something as simple as a spelling mistake. So, and, and this is where good technical capacities and building of those technical capacities do come in. And certain donors are very willing to build the technical capacities of young organizations if you're willing to ask for. The, bridge, the gap, I think very likely Amanda said in bridging the gap between the donors as well as the young organizations is that we sit on two sides of the table. And our particular issue is that as donors, I, I'm aware of the LGBT issue, like sort of groundwork in Sri Lanka, but I'm not as well versed with ethnic and religious issues. So, but as donors, if you as a young organization or an organization that is led by young people come and tell us, this is what we need. We can always, there's always leeway. There's always financial grounds to restructure budgets on a certain level. There's always that. But having said that, there are very stringent donors will, who will always ask for very strict guidelines. But yeah. it also, it's also a certain point where the donors doesn't necessarily know what you need. So if you need anything, always, always ask. Because the donors are just human beings. They're not going to, don't go under the assumption that, know, that they know better than you. They don't. Some of them are not even from the same region. They are from a different continent in itself. They do not understand the ground reality. So coming back to the point what Justin said, because we need to communicate the ground realities yeah. of working as a youth organization here. And some of them are actually willing to accommodate. 
That is very, very, very insightful, Tharinda. Thank you for uplifting all of these points. Just one last thing, because I think it's very relevant to what you shared, is what happens when young organizations don't have proof of previous funding? Um, and they most often also lose their chances of funding because of credibility and reporting. And this is, again, connected to uh, communication challenges. Uh, so how, what are the avenues available and how do donors think uh, in this respect? So we had an issue because when Hashtag Generation started, we were not a registered NGO in Sri Lanka. And because we were not a registered NGO, we couldn't get funds from anywhere else. So our core group of volunteers that started off, we also had to sort of rely on volunteers who could able to do two jobs at once, which is one at hashtag and you do another job somewhere else that pays you because this is not going to give you a financial incentive. All of us were there because we wanted to make a change and all of that. And then how we first started was we got a small grant from Frida, which is sort of how we started. There are plenty of opportunities out there. And this is, again, where I come to the point of social networking, because there are a lot of other bigger social organizations or youth organizations that are already established. And if you look at a grant proposal, there's always parts where they say how much of the money that we're giving you, how much of it is trickling down to other grassroots level organizations. This is where we as young organizations can plug in. This is where why we need to talk to our peers. This is why we need to understand the inter relationships between different organizations because you can work on an environment. It does not mean you cannot work with women's rights issues because the moment a disaster hit, it's always the children and the women that are affected. So this finding right. is interlinkages be between right. issues and also looking for other opportunities apart from the broader, more capitalist entrance social structures that sort of give out funding right. and grants. Yeah, that's amazing, Sarinda. Sorry, Natasha. Amazing, Tarinda. Uh, thank you a lot for sharing your uh, perspective from both sides, from donor sides and NGO side. Uh, this is really well when you have an opportunity to hear one person that is in both roles. And now I would like to welcome Sharon. I hope so that I pronounced your name good. Can you turn on your ca camera? Hello, Sharon. We're unable to hear you. Bonjour. Yes, now we can. Could you, I think you will have to speak a little louder. D'accord, là vous m'entendez? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, d'accord. Moi, je veux... Uh, okay, moi, je voulais parler par rapport à mon organisation. Je lutte contre la corruption euh, au Gabon et euh, je suis jeune leader, jeune activiste de lutte contre la corruption. Mais pour avoir des donateurs, c'est vraiment, dif vraiment difficile parce que euh, parfois, il m'est arrivé de, de, de demander des demandes d'aide à mon pays, mais cela a toujours été décliné tout simplement parce que euh, je dénonce beaucoup euh, je parle beaucoup de la mal gouvernance de mon pays et il est difficile de m'aider. À ce moment, moi, j'aimerais savoir qu'est-ce que je peux mettre en place pour avoir des, des, des financements au niveau de l'international avec des, des, des donateurs internationaux en lieu et place de ceux de mon pays, par exemple. Allô Great, amazing. Uh, thank you, Sharon, uh, for uh, sharing your story and enjoying, uh, enjoying our circle. Uh, do we have time, Natasha, for one more question from Q&A box? Uh, we could. I think a lot of people are also just sharing their comments and stories in the Q&A box. Maybe we can bring in one more person if they want to share a, one la uh, any comment. Okay, uh, I will bring uh, Latoya. Justin, you will go out for uh, one minute. No. Hello, Latoya. It's is she here? Mm. Hello. Can we hear you? 
No, I don't think they have joined yet. I don't see them. I saw them. Okay, maybe it's connection problem because they were here and then. Yeah. Um, I also, so um, Sharon has also elaborated a little uh, on her question and maybe this can be connected to other um, uh, participants' concerns as well, is when you're working in a country uh, where there probably uh, is corruption or strict rules from the government um, and it becomes difficult because of that to get donors, how do you proceed in that, uh, especially when like, power structures like this are working against uh, youth activists. So anybody from the current fishbowl, Justin, Tharinda, uh, or we can um, uh, maybe uh, ask Sharon to move and bring another member to respond to Sharon's question. Mm, I don't know why it's not working. Uh, I tried to, oh, again, the same person come in, but I will call Kwame to join us. Hmm? Oui, je suis là, Sharon, je suis là. Oui, je suis là. I'm here. Okay. Another check, uh, can you repeat what you yes. did you tell about Sharon? Yes. Yes. So um, I just want to also be sensitive of time. I think multiple things are happening at the same time because of technology. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a pause over there. Um, and if uh, Jelena, are we not able to add anybody else into the circle right now? Uh, here's Kwame. Just uh, if he wants to share something or answer a question, you have two minutes or more and then we need to close up really fast. Yes. So, so Kwame, you have to unmute yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah, you have two minutes, but really keep it short and simple. D'accord. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour le droit Merci aussi pour cette initiative. Nous sommes une organisation de jeunes qui est intervenant dans le domaine de la promotion de l'entrepreneuriat social et également c'est bon c'est bon oui c'est ici d'accord je disais que eh, nous nous sommes une organisation de jeunes et nous intervenons dans le domaine de la promotion de l'entrepreneuriat social et également dans la lutte contre le changement climatique. Et ma question, c'est par rapport à l'intervention de M. Justin, et où j'aimerais savoir, dans la mesure où, par exemple, vous avez euh, un donateur et que euh, ce dernier, avant de vous financer, euh, vous a vous faites partager ces, ces conditions, mais pourtant vous voyez que ces conditions ne cadrent pas avec votre vision. Ne cadrent pas avec votre vision, d'autant plus que nous avons nos réalités, le contexte sur le terrain, et dans la mise en œuvre du projet, vous vous rendez compte que eh, eh, si vous, vous, vous continuez selon eh, les règles, selon le point de vue du partenaire, vous n'y atteindrez pas eh, les résultats sur le terrain. Ou bien... Eh, vous ne pouvez pas eh, arriver à atteindre la vision du, de l'organisation. Dans ce cas, qu'est-ce qu'on fait D'autant plus qu'en tant qu'une organisation de jeunes, nous avons aussi besoin d'un financement puisque eh, c'est au début et ce n'est toujours pas facile pour les organisations de jeunes de pouvoir avoir accès au financement. Dans ce cas, qu'est-ce qu'on fait et, et voilà ma question. Merci beaucoup. Thank you a lot, Kwame, uh, because we do not have enough time. I'm so sorry. Uh, we have a lot of uh, questions in Q&A blog box. We'll find a way to answer on it. 
we can uh, even record it as a video or someone will write blog and answer all of you on your questions and your call me questions question justin will answer uh, in written way uh thank you sharon thank you call me thank you torinda i will now move you again in, an, in this panel and i will uh, move our speakers in the panelist panel Natasha, you can he help me actually. Uh, yeah, move, uh, please move uh, panelists again here. Hello back. And uh, uh, amazing. Hello again. Before uh, we continue, actually, before we closed up everything, and before we thanks to our uh, lovely uh, speakers, uh, I would like to invite uh, our uh, storyline, our graphic designers, to show us what they did. Guys. Hi guys, uh, could you please uh, allow us for graphic recording to put the share screen on? It's it's our other account, so you, we can see uh, what we. Can you just tell me name of the account? Graphic recording. Okay, I did it. Thanks. Super excited, I can't wait to see this. Yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> okay, I think this, oh, wow. Wow, amazing, amazing job, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this we is brilliant. To add color, so. We will just add some more color into, into this whole thing and it will uh, look even better in a few minutes. I want a copy of this for sure. I, I need, I need it. I need yeah. to print it and keep it. <laughs> yeah, Irina, Irina, Nena, and Jovana, thank you for amazing job. And last year you also did amazing job on International Civic Society Week. Uh, thank you for this. Can you just turn off your sharing screen? Yes, of course. Amazing, uh, excellent job, guys. And I would like uh, all attendees to ask uh, to look at their chat. Uh, Bistra, uh, Yesenia, and our, our other team, part of team, they send a really important message to you, a message that is important for us. We want to hear your feedback on this conversation. We want to hear, uh, did you like it? Uh, and if you don't like it, what can be better? Yeah. Yes, and um, I know that there were a lot of questions, so uh, once again requesting everybody to check out the playbook. Maybe some of your questions will get answered over there. Uh, so definitely, definitely do that. Uh, we are now officially closing uh, the webinar with two final asks. One that as you look through the playbook, if you have any feedback, use hashtag CivicusYouth or write to us at youth at civicus.org. Um, directly and we would love to hear from you and lastly um, like we had mentioned Yelena and I are both part of the uh, youth action team and the youth action team we're hosting a virtual coffee chat with all our youth members to get to know each other ask questions discuss ideas on 29th April 1 p.m. GMT we really really look forward to connecting uh, with most of you uh, over there so please join us uh, for that and, and that's about it. Uh, sign up for the newsletter. Use hashtag ICSW2021 to follow all the latest information 
on the uh, amazing events that are happening. That's about it. Thank you once again for being. Thank you guys today. again. And I forgot to mention today is Earth Day. So stand for what you stand on, guys. Thank you, Yelena. That was thank a good you. one to close the conversation on. Stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Big applause for everyone. Thank yes, you very thank much, you, everyone. Guys. Thank Great. you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, translators.